why is it seen as a problem play and why do I see it as such a great play? Some people see the Duke as, um, you know, not quite somebody knows what to do in the situation where there's a um, lot of loose morals around and he's not really dealing with it. He's let, let the laws slip. Obviously, he's a very kind, merciful guy, but it's not doing the society much good. Um, so he passes the job on to Angelo, you know, for Angelo to do it, and then that causes further problems and so on. So that's one way of seeing the Duke. But the other way of seeing the Duke is that he's rather like Prospero. And he knows he can't himself redress the, um, what's going on. But if he trains the people, right people wisely and so on, takes them through initiation, um, the right, right result will ensue. But he has to do a lot of work with a lot of people. So let's have a look at... These are the characters. So in Shakespeare's comedies, this is a comedy. Shakespeare's comedies, he can choose the names, which he always does very carefully. So you've got Vicentio, the victorious one. And, the, and the, uh, you know, there's a lot, lot of the Bible in Shakespeare, a um, lot of references to biblical statements. So one can see he's chosen this name, the victorious one, also to link with the Lamb of God, because, because the one who is seen as victorious in Christianity is, is Jesus, who is known as the Lamb of God. So that's... Why has he been named that? Is that something he's, he's, he, he is, or is it something he's trying to reach, or is it just a joke? You know, it's, it's a question, isn't it? Then Isabella, it means beautiful lady. Um, Issa, lady, and um, it's also the feminine of Yesu, which, is, which means Lord. Um, so again, you've got this Christian or biblical context to it. Then Angelo, angel, means angel. So three things linking you directly with the Bible here, with very deep wisdom teachings. And then you've got Mary Ann. Well, Mary, Mary Ann's made up of Mary and Anne. Anne was the mother of Mary, Mary's mother Jesus. You know, you've got, again, very important biblical thing. Then Aeschylus, the, the old lord, it actually is a symbol of, this, of the scales, it means scales that keep the balance, measure for measure, keep, keep the right balance. Um, and it also, is a, as a name, links, links with Aesculapius, the, um, the great healer of classical times. Then you've got Claudio. Claudio means the lame one. And that's, that's an interesting name, really. And Juliet means the youthful one. Then Lucio means light, but it's referring to the light of the moon, which is variable and changing. So sometimes it's full and sometimes it's dark and so on. And pro the provost, well, it just means the overseer or superintendent, the steward or bailiff or the warden. So these are names carefully chosen for some reason. Oh, and Ludovic is the name the duke takes when he dresses as a friar. Fra Ludovic. Well, the, the name is derived from the word Lewis. And the Lewis can mean lion-like. That's the Celtic, Celtic origin of it. And it in, in, um, and also means stands for strength. And Freemasonry uses that um, in its teachings. And so it will refer to a Freemason, um, uh, often called, called the son of a Mason, um, as, as a Lewis. And it also is the name of what hoists the building block um, when you're constructing a temple you know, in, in masonry. And, and the Lewis hooks onto the, onto the block of stone and can raise it up. So that, that's a little key as to why he should take on this name. It's, it's a Freemasonic name, it's a Freemasonic symbol, and it's to do with raising a stone from a lower level to a higher level. And in, in tradition, including biblical tradition, 
um, where Jesus refers, or Jesus re is referred to as the stone, um, stone that's rejected by the builders. The, the stone in Freemasonry and the older wisdom traditions represents the human soul. And we, as it were, we come into incarnation, our experiences carve that stone to, to get it to the right shape. And then you, when you got it to the right shape, you polish it. And when it's absolutely perfect, it can be raised up and built into the temple on high, which is our, our higher soul. That, that's, that's the symbolism of it. So it has that one name has a, has a very, very deep, deep, deep meaning in it. And then just to remind us the alchemical cycle. So as it, you re look at this as if it's a clock, clock face. So starting at the top, we go in our life process, you go from impulse to a desire to a thought to an action. So something creates an impulse within us or something from the outside. It then gives rise to a desire. I want something. That's our will, the desire. I want. It's, it's, it's a powerful emotion. And that then sets going then the thinking. You then think about what you want and how you're going to put into practice. And then having got that thought clear enough, you put it into practice as, as the action. Impulse, desire, thought, action. And when we're doing things in a good way, that desire becomes a good desire or good will, which is God's will, good will. It's a loving, loving desire. And then our thoughts become true understanding and that put into practice, you put pra that love and understanding into practice, it becomes an act, act of love, which is called service or charity. And that's initiation. And um, in this play, you'd be able to see that People start at the mundane level, just ordinary impulses and thought action, and through the way the Duke manipulates the whole thing that's going on, well, well he partly manipulates, the, the rest is done just by what people set in motion. Um, it, it's, it takes some of the characters through a development where they become initiates, where, when their desires actually become loving their thoughts, true understanding, and their actions are of real service. They're charitable. And, and part of charity is, um, well, it's helping other people, basically, <coughs> and, um, and willing to give your life in service that others might have a better life, and so on. So, but the, the plan of the of this play, like other plays, you have the scene is set, you know, what, what is gonna, what's the impulse for the whole story? Then you go into the desires and emotional part of it all. Then it develops into thoughts, which include, you know, planning this and that, plotting and so on. And then the thoughts go into action that re result from that. And some, in some plays, that cycle repeats over and over again. Um, in this play, there's just one big cycle. Sorry, can we... How do we turn this off? Uh, okay. So if, if I walk you through this cycle, it's worth seeing this, because this, this immediately... Here is a wisdom, a basic law of life that Shakespeare knows and he uses absolutely perfectly as a master. He knows this backwards. And so it's quite natural for him to, to always use this cycle when he's, he's uh, planning any, any story. Um, so it starts off the impulse as the Duke of Vienna leaves Angelo in charge with Aeschylus to help to restore order to Vienna. Then he takes on a disguise to watch his deputy and Angelo then invokes an old law long ignored, and Claudio is imprisoned, sentenced to death by Angelo for getting his fiancée Juliet pregnant, and that's the start of the emotions. All these great desires, emotions, and feelings start to come up. 
So Aeschylus pleads with Angelo to be more merciful. Isabella pleads with Angelo to spare the life of her brother Claudio. Angelo develops unholy desires towards Isabella. And the Duke visits the prison, discovers that Claudio and Juliet's love and betrothal are real, real love, and that they are betrothed, which in, in law, still in English law, if you have a proper um, betrothal, you know, uh, you, you promise to marry each other, and, it, and it's done with witnesses, and then it's consummated, actually taken as a legal act of marriage. Not many people know that, but that, that is in the, in, the, in the basic common law, um, that that can happen. The church changes it into something different. Um, and they marry, and then you have Mar Mariana's continuing love for Angelo is, is revealed. And then we go into all the thinking, plotting, planning, and so on. So Angelo's base corrupt proposition, he, he makes this corrupt proposition to Isabella. Um, and the Duke prepares Claudio for death. That's part of his plan of what, how he's going to uh, manage this whole thing. And the Duke's plan is substitution of Mariana for Isabella. So, so a lot about the Duke and how he's going to work this out to produce something good to come out of it. And then the actions follow from all of that. The substitution takes place and Angelo is successfully deceived. But Angelo doesn't keep his word and secretly orders Claudia's execution to take place immediately. The Duke orders the substitution of a dead man for Claudio. And the Duke returns, Angelo accused by Isabella, and Isabella is arrested. The Duke leaves, the friar brought in to answer charges. The friar reveals himself as the Duke, Angelo confesses. The Duke sentences Angelo to marry Mariana, followed by execution, his execution. Then Mariana and Isabella plead for Angelo's life. Which when you look at the play in, in the way it, I'm looking at it, you can see that's the whole aim of the, the Duke's plan. To get people pleading for mercy as well as for, for um, Angelo to suddenly see what he's done wrong and, and really be sorry about it you know, be, be repent about it. So he's sorry about it, he's prepared to die, I think he should die, because um, he'd done something absolutely wrong and, and sinful, and so he's, he's ready for death, and so on. And then he has two women pleading for mercy for him, and that's it, that's what does it. So Claudio is able to be brought out to show he's still alive, so therefore the Duke, by, by law, is able to pardon him. Because um, if, if, if Claudio had died, been executed in that way, Angelo, by law, would, would have had to be executed himself. But because Claudio is still alive, um, the Duke is able to pardon and give, give mercy to them all. So Angelo is forgiven and reprieved. And then the Duke proposes marriage to Isabella to summarise, to, to end the whole thing, which happens in, in most of these initiatory comedy stories. <laughs> So it's a fabulous structure here. That alone shows something very deep in this. And then you've got, got the name of the play. Some of the play names are not so obvious, but this is really makes you look straight away at, at the Bible, measure for measure. One of the main things that comes in the play is the Duke, Duke Vincentio, says, um, like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. In, in the folio, measure for measure, the measures are spelt with capital M's. These, these things are important. And the Bible Old Testament is one way of seeing this, when, um, which most people would think it was what it means. The Bible or Testament is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for foot. Mm. That's the law. Karma, karmic law. Um, what you sow, you, you will reap, Jesus says. That's, that's like measure for like measure at that level of, of, it, of life. But then Jesus shows a higher law. 
he teaches, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. That's from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus again, he said to them, take heed what you hear, the measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. Wow. In another place he says, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your, into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And this, this brings up the two great laws um, of life, uh, which are known as the laws of karma, or cause and effect, and the law of redemption. And one way of seeing this is on the Kabbalistic tree of life. Now this is the diagram seen face to face. So you, see, you look at it as if you're seeing another person face to face. Many of the diagrams you see in books will be seeing it from the back view because um, they say st it's easier for students to relate to that tree if they can just step into it as it were but some people get confused by this so I'm just trying to make it clear this is what Hebrews call the panim face to face you're seeing truth face to face like seeing another person face to face it's not a mirror image it's face face to face so the left hand is over there the right hand over this side, just like you're looking at me, face facing you. And the left hand side is associated with judgment, perception, um, discipline, discrimination and severity. And, um, and also ultimately with the mind, with, with thinking. Whereas the right hand side is associated more with the heart and it's associated with, with wisdom, with mercy, with grace, with compassion, um, generosity and friendship. And the idea is we have to learn to balance the two perfectly, not to be more of one or more of the other. The, the idea is we follow what's called the middle path, balancing these two. But if we're all on the one side, poof, things go wrong, um, which, which one could see when Angelo took charge. He was almost totally on that left-hand side without much compassion or mercy or anything in him. He just was super righteous, <laughs> um, very severe person, and that balance had to be redressed. Now redemption, it's, it's taught, and um, it's taught in the wisdom tradition. Um, Francis Bacon is somebody who makes it very clear in his writings, so more people might know, but redemption is the higher law. But to operate, it needs forgiveness and repentance. Otherwise, you can, you can offer mercy, but it has absolutely no effect unless there's been forgiveness that's taken part and the person who's being offered mercy really repents of what that person, he or she has done wrong. And then the mercy can be received. It'll work. Otherwise, it won't work. Otherwise, like going to, you know, somebody, a murderer, be, being put in prison, you say, okay, we're going to let you off your prison sentence, you can go free, and he goes off and does another murder, you know, because he hasn't changed, he hasn't repented. And um, so one has to bring somebody to that point of wanting to change their ways, and then they can be helped to lead, lead a better life um, after that. So that's that absolute key, and Shakespeare understood this. He brings it out in this play, and he brings it out in other plays. Uh, a very prominent one is, is um, um, Merchant of Venice, uh, where Portia is trying to bring this out, and she, she explains this whole, how the whole thing works. Bible teachings, obviously, Shakespeare thought were very important from Jesus. Be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And why beholdest thou the mote that in thy brother's eye, that, that is in thy brother's eye, but considered not the beam that is in thine own eye? And then a summary of, of 
various of his teachings, love God who is love and love each other. Love God who is love and love each other. Shakespeare knew this, what he's trying to bring out and teach us all through entertainment. And it's even in the, hinted at in, in the folio, printing of the folio. If you look at the title, Measure for Measure, Measure for Measure. So you always, the right, we read from right to left. So the first measure is the right hand and the second measure is the, on, on the left hand side. First measure there is above the second measure, and it's huge. It's in capitals, it's emboldened, it's bigger lettering than the other measure. What's it saying, isn't it? <coughs> Mercy is supreme over karma. If you apply the mercy, it's a much greater law, more powerful law than the other law, and will transmute the situations that people will be in in the other law. It's right there, just in that wonderful printing. And then they put, you know, this is more of a subtle thing. Um, and and it's, you can't expect everyone to see, see this one. And that's the comma after measure. Measure, comma, for measure. Why the comma? Well, one thing it does, it makes you pause. Measure for measure. When, you, when you're made to pause, it makes you think. Measure. Okay. For measure. And then you start to hear it more as music. And in music, there's what's called the Pythagorean comma. And that's known to be the magical moment. Nobody can explain it. The Pythagorean comma. Magic. Measure. Measure. The true measure. The mercy is magic, magical. So if you become a great person who can give mercy and knows how to help people get to that point of being able to receive mercy, if you get to that great stage, you are a true magician, like, like Prospero was, it is shown in The Tempest. He brought many people through initiation. And Duke Vicentio, in this play, shows mercy at the end. He pardons all except Lucio, and that's important because Lucio is the one who slanders the Duke, Duke's good name. He slanders the Duke's good name. And in the Apocrypha, there is a statement that Jesus says. He says that all sins will be pardoned except for the one against the Holy Spirit, which is to slander another person's good name. Fantastic, isn't it? Shows Shakespeare read, read that Apocrypha, that Apocryphal book. Very, very key. So one can see, which, which I'm, I'm seeing, um, Sarah will show a different viewpoint. <laughs> Vicento is actually acting as the tester and initiator, like Prospero. He has self-knowledge and he has temperance. In fact, these things are said. He, he's said to have this. Um, and so... When he's disguised, when the Duke's disguised as a friar, he asks somebody else, he says, I pray you, sir, what disposition was the Duke? And Aeschylus, who, who's being asked, replies, one that above all other strifes contended especially to know himself. Know thyself. And then the Duke goes on to ask Aeschylus, what pleasure was he given to? And Aeschylus replies, Rather than rejoicing to see another merry, than merry at anything which professed to make him rejoice, a gentleman of all temperance. A balance, following the middle path, in other words. Temperance is, is somebody who found that balance in themselves. And this goes right back to the ancient Egyptian mysteries and, and older. Uh, for instance, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi had over its entrance the inscription, Know thyself. Know thyself, and also a second statement, nothing in excess. Nothing in excess, and know thyself. And this is, this is what it is. And temperance is the same as measure for measure in balance, which is also moderation. The middle path, 
So I find it interesting too that Francis Bacon, I know is key in the whole of this, um, his, his family motto is mediocria firma, which means the middle way or mediocrity, the middle way is firm, is true, is the true way. And then the Duke, Vicencio, understands and tests Angelo. He brings out his knowledge of Angelo. He says, Angelo, there is a kind of character in thy use that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. So it's a statement that he's saying to Angelo, I can see your whole history in you. I, I, I fully know you. Don't think I don't. And then the Duke gives Angelo power over mortality and mercy to see what he would do with it. And then Mariana, at some point in, in Act 5, says a lovely remark. They say best men are moulded out of faults and for the most become much more be the better for being a little bad. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the old teaching, isn't it? We, we actually learn by making mistakes, as long as we learn from them. You know, but that, that's how we get better and better at anything. Um, whether it's just, you know, making something or, or a business we're doing. But in terms of morals, it's the same thing applies. By making certain mistakes sometimes, recognising that mistake, we then strive to do better because we've got more knowledge about it the next time. So we, that's how we get initiated. And the other great thing it's brought out here is this, the um, self-righteousness of Angelo. You know, there's somebody who thinks he's a very righteous person, he's celibate, he's... You know, it's, it's a bit of a comment on some of the churchmen, isn't it, really? Um, celibacy. I always liked some years ago with uh, Pope John, who, you know, the famous Pope who liked to travel around. People loved him. He was in Ireland once, and he was asked by somebody, saying, why, why do all the priests of the church have to be unmarried and celibate? You know, what's the spiritual reason for it? And he said, well, there is no spiritual reason. He said, it's purely economic. The church can decide it cannot f afford to pay for wives and families of their priests. Therefore, we ask our priests to remain unmarried. Yet all these hundreds of years, people have been assuming, including local priests, parish priests, that it's a spiritual requirement to be celibate. It's not. You know, I mean, that's... I thought that was a huge revelation <laughs> when that came out. And um, so I see this as partly a comment by Shakespeare on the self-righteous people who say, celibate, I'm celibate, therefore I'm purer than you. You know, I, I'm, I'm better than you. Self-righteousness, pride before a fall. And this is what Angelo gets. Angelo says, it is one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. And Aeschylus says aside, well, heaven forgive him and forgive us all. Some rise by sin and some by virtue fall. Some run from breaks of ice and answer none and some condemn for a fault alone. So Aeschylus is the wise one in all this. He's a very great character. And as I mentioned, Duke also tests and initiates Mariana, Claudio and Isabella. Requ requ requires... Re repentance, surrender, forgiveness, and the plea for mercy. And Isabella has a particular set of initiates. She really is raised as a true initiate. And one way of seeing that the steps of initiate she goes through is using the tree of life again. So she starts off as a novice in the nunnery, and that, that relates to number nine of the tree of life. It's symbolized by the moon. Purity, you know, she's dedicated herself to be a novice, to be um, celibate all her life as a nun. She's married to God, you know, uh, or married to Christ. And, um, but she's a novice. She's not, she's not yet fully, fully made it, t taken her final vows. Um, and then she's thrown into this situation to plead for, to Angelo for Claudia's life. So that's the next step, number eight on this tree of life. Um, she's trying to use her wit and so on to persuade Angelo um, and then she, when Angelo reveals his lust for her um, she refuses to give in to it so that's the step seven which is symbolized by Venus on, on the tree of life 
And then she visits Claudia in prison. There's a brother-sister love and predicament that comes out there, uh, plus the friar's advice. And this is very much to do with the, the centre of that tree of life, number six, symbolised by the sun. And in the, in the tarot cards, for instance, you get the brother and sister put together, or the twins, or the lovers sometimes they're called, as, as the tarot card there. Then, then the next step after that, she's taken through... She accuses Angelo in the presence of the Duke, but er then she's arrested on Duke's orders. So she's acting s severely. She's, she's judging, she's in the position of judging somebody else and saying that man's done wrong and so on. And so that's number five of the Tree of Life, which is to do with judgment and so on. And then, it, then she gets finally to the step number four, um, which is to do with mercy, and she asks the Duke for mercy for Angelo. Um, so all that love comes out, poured out. Um, you know, mercy for this man who wanted to rape me. And, um, and at the same time, she's trying to help, help um, Mariana as well, who, who loves, loves Angelo. So there's that wonderful act of love in, in number, six, number four. She's reached that point. And then the final thing, the Duke <coughs> offers her marriage. And we don't know whether she accepts or goes back to the church. We're left not to know. But that's going up into the beyond, past what's called the veil in, um, in the Tree of Life. <coughs> so it's such a clear path, beautifully mapped out by, by Shakespeare. So I'd better wind up there. I think that's enough to show you. Um, but there are other things to look at. The disguise and deception. Is disguise a good idea or not? Often we think it's awful if somebody goes in disguise, and yet here's some good being done in it. Um, you know, what, what's the importance of secrecy and openness or concealing and revealing? Why did the Duke become a friar, which is a Franciscan. Why does he choose that? Other plays that it's done the same. It's always a Franciscan. Why? Why is a Franciscan? Why not another sort of priest? Um, and, and other questions we, we could look at. Okay. I'll stop there, because then Sarah will give the other point of view, which is also very, very good. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have a, have a short break first. <coughs>